There is an important new technology of defense, a technology of national security fully capable of raising any country, no matter how small, to true invincibility. <clears throat> This new technology of defense is based upon the latest discoveries in the fields of physics, neuroscience, and physiology, and is based upon the discovery of the unified field of all the laws of nature, the most fundamental and powerful level of nature's dynamics. Technologies based upon this unified field of natural law have such concentrated power that they can render obsolete and irrelevant every previous method of objective technology and all previous destructive means of defense. This new technology is easily applied and highly cost effective and can literally raise any country to a degree of invincibility, absolute invulnerability to attack or any form of disruption from within the country or outside the country. As I said, this new technology for defense, this technology for invincibility, is based upon the discovery of the unified field. Modern science, led by modern quantum physics, has probed deeper levels of nature's functioning. From the macroscopic world of classical physics to the world of the atom, as this chart shows, and underlying the atom is the field of the nucleus and subnuclear levels of nature's functioning, culminating in the discovery of the unified field, the most fundamental and powerful level of nature's dynamics. The unified field is the unified source of the diversified laws of nature governing the universe. From its purely self-interacting dynamics, the unified field creates from itself all the particles and forces that comprise the universe and the diversified streams of natural law <clears throat> governing the nuclear, atomic, molecular, and macroscopic levels. Because this unified field is vastly more powerful than any other level of nature's dynamics, a technology of defense based upon the unified field is a technology of historic importance will completely change the whole science and technology of defense. <clears throat> Let me first emphasize that the discovery of the unified field is not a philosophical development. It's a scientific development of the foremost order. It's a rigorous mathematical development, as this chart shows, based upon the Lagrangian of the unified field, a highly compact mathematical formula that describes the self-interacting dynamics of unity at the basis of all the diverse laws of nature governing the universe. From this simple compact formula at the top of this chart, one can <clears throat> systematically derive all the emerging laws of nature that are the subjects of study of the different scientific disciplines. <clears throat> For example, here at the bottom of this chart, we see the supersymmetric grand unified field theory emerging from the Lagrangian of the superstring <clears throat> through a series of rigorous mathematical transformations that allow us to derive the grand unified level from the super unified level of the unified field from the dynamics of the superstring. A technology based upon this complete level, most comprehensive level of nature's functioning, is completely different than all previous defensive technologies based upon diversified levels of natural law. That means nuclear technologies, chemical technologies, biological technologies of defense, electronic technologies of defense, all of which utilize specific laws of nature in isolation, all of which therefore have results not being holistic that have been historically accompanied by unforeseen negative side effects, like the toxicants of nuclear power and so forth. The technology of the unified field, however, clearly is vastly more powerful than any previous level of defensive technology. This chart, for example, shows the unique power 
of the unified field and technologies of the unified field <clears throat> showing that invincibility in nature is only available at the super unified scale, only at the level of the unified field. This chart shows the hierarchical structure of natural law from fundamentally unified to superficially diverse at the macroscopic levels of nature's functioning and reveals that invincibility is not found in nature at any of these more superficial levels of natural law. Invincibility only exists at the level of the unified field, as this chart makes abundantly clear. Now, any defense strategist today understands this principle, I think, because it is already known that more fundamental, more powerful levels of nature's functioning <clears throat> offer technologies that are increasingly powerful. For example, it is commonly understood that ultimately a country that is armed only with chemical weaponry, like explosives, cannot really protect itself against a nation that is equipped with nuclear weaponry, simply because nuclear weaponry is vastly more powerful. But it's important to understand why this is the case. This is the case due to a simple application of the basic quantum principle or uncertainty principle of increasing dynamism at more fundamental scales. The quantum principle states that the characteristic energy or dynamism associated with a physical process is inversely proportional to the characteristic distance scale or time scale associated with that process. And that's why nuclear power associated with nuclear transitions, which take place at the nuclear scale, is a million times more powerful than chemical transformations based upon chemical technologies, which are technologies of the molecular scale. The atomic nucleus is a million times smaller and a million times more powerful, and hence a million times more powerful, again, than the chemical level. Let us take, for example, the most impregnable, most invincible structure known to man, and that is the structure of a diamond lattice, a crystalline lattice of carbon molecules, carbon atoms. This most tightly packed lattice of carbon atoms is considered to be an invincible structure on its own level, on the chemical level. Nothing else can even scratch the surface of a diamond. So invincible is its chemical lattice. However, if the diamond, the lattice of carbon atoms, contains a contamination of radioactive carbon, so-called carbon-12, whose nuclei are unstable against nuclear beta decay, when inevitably one of these carbon nuclei undergoes a nuclear decay, millions of electron volts of energy are liberated and the entire crystalline structure of the diamond is easily shattered. That's because the typical binding energies of these carbon atoms in the lattice is typically an electron volt. The energy liberated by one of these nuclear transitions within the lattice is millions of electron volts. And hence what was previously an impregnable structure of the diamond lattice is easily shattered by access to a deeper level of nature's functioning, through access to a nuclear decay. Similarly, we can take the most impregnable structure at the nuclear level of nature's functioning, and that is the iron nucleus. The iron nucleus is the most tightly packed and tightly bound nucleus that is absolutely impregnable on its own level. An iron nucleus can survive even a nuclear explosion and is the most invincible structure at the nuclear level of nature's functioning. However, the iron nucleus comprised of nucleons, protons and neutrons, each of those nucleons have the possibility of decay into a spray of electromagnetic energy through the action of what are called the grand unified X and Y leptocork gauge bosons, that is, functioning at the grand unified level. 
Those grand unified forces have the capability of transforming a proton within the iron nucleus into a spray of electromagnetic energy, liberating literally billions of electron volts and easily shattering the integrity of the iron nucleus. Therefore, what was an impregnable structure at the nuclear level, the iron nucleus, is easily shattered by, easily overwhelmed by, a phenomenon of the grand unified level, a level that is a thousand million million times more fundamental than the nuclear level. This illustrates the principle <clears throat> that what was an invincible structure at one level of technology is easily overwhelmed by a more fundamental level of technology. The ultimate application of this basic principle is that the unified field at the super unified scale, the Planck scale of nature's functioning, which is 10,000 times more fundamental and more powerful even than the grand unified forces, is completely invincible. Any previous level of technology, including technologies of defense, can be easily overwhelmed and rendered obsolete and irrelevant through a technology of the unified field. And it is just such a technology of the unified field that we are presenting to the leaders in the field of defense today. At this point, the intelligent viewer may ask the question, is such a technology of the unified field safe? Many scientists and statesmen have been concerned that the development of nuclear power has threatened humankind with nuclear conflagration and has cast an umbrella on the safety and security of the whole world. What potential dangers could accompany a technology of the unified field that is a thousand million million times more powerful? Fortunately, there is no danger to humankind threatened by these technologies of the unified field. Indeed, as the same chart shows, a technology of the unified field is a unified technology, a technology that operates at the basis of this chart at a completely unified and holistic level of nature's functioning. Because this level of natural law is holistic, it is naturally free of negative, unanticipated side effects that would accompany a partial technology based upon a fragmented level of natural law. <clears throat> this unified field is the unified source of all the laws of nature governing the universe. It is a field of a purely life-supporting, life-nourishing influence that gave rise to all life in all forms and phenomena in the universe. From that unified level, which is completely nourishing and life-supporting in its nature, only life-supporting effects are possible. And this has been confirmed now by over 600 scientific studies that have explored the effects on individual life and the life of society have explored the effects of this technology of the unified field and have found only life-supporting, life-nourishing, holistically positive benefits, as you would expect based upon the holistic nature of the technology involved. Let us consider now the very special nature of the technologies of this unified field and understand practically how this field can be applied for the benefit of life and to achieve national security and invincibility. To understand the application of the unified field, it is important to understand its fundamental nature. And the fundamental qualities of the unified field actually identify this field with the field of intelligence, a field of consciousness. The qualities of the unified field can be systematically derived mathematically through analysis of the Lagrangian of the unified field presented before. All the qualities of the unified field can be systematically obtained through analysis of the mathematics of the structure and self-interacting dynamics 
of this field of unity, as shown in this chart. But let me just focus on two or three of the fundamental qualities of the unified field that identify this field unambiguously as a field of consciousness, a field of universal intelligence. Firstly, let's recall that the unified field is the unified source, the fountainhead of all the laws of nature governing the universe. But the laws of nature governing the universe are the orderly principles, the intelligent principles governing the world around us that render the world orderly, repeatable, intelligible to the mind. It is the fundamental premise of our scientific age that this world is governed by laws of nature, intelligent, orderly principles, and therefore is predictable, knowable, comprehensible to the mind. Modern science for the last 300 years has studied and enumerated these laws of nature, the orderly principles governing the universe. So if the laws of nature governing the universe are the principles of intelligence behind the functioning of nature, and if the unified field is the unified fountainhead of all these diverse laws of nature, then the unified field must itself be the most concentrated field of intelligence in nature. And that is absolutely the case, as can be confirmed mathematically, as we have seen in this previous formula, <clears throat> that shows that all the intelligence governing the universe, including the laws governing the grand unified level, electroweak unified level, nuclear level, atomic level, molecular level, macroscopic level, astrophysical and cosmological levels of creation. All these intelligent principles can be systematically derived from the unified field itself through this process of sequential unfoldment known as spontaneous symmetry breaking. <coughs> so we've established mathematically that the unified field is a field of intelligence. But it is not a field of static or inert intelligence. It's a field of dynamic intelligence. <coughs> this we have already seen <coughs> on the basis of the quantum principle or uncertainty principle, which is the principle of increasing dynamism at more fundamental scales. The reason why the nuclear force is a million times more powerful than the chemical force. By the same principle of increasing power, increasing dynamism at fundamental scales, the unified field being the ultimate distance scale of nature. The Planck scale of nature's functioning is the ultimate scale of nature's dynamism. Virtually infinitely dynamic is its nature. So the unified field is a dynamic field of intelligence. And it is self-aware, self-interacting, Self-referral, because this property of self-referral, self-awareness, is the defining characteristic of consciousness. Let me take a moment to explain this quality a bit more completely. If we look at this chart again, we will see that all the fields of nature, all the particles and forces, emerge from the unified field. But some of these more expressed fields, like the electromagnetic field shown towards the bottom left in this chart, the electromagnetic field does not have this lively quality of self-referral, self-interaction. Two flashlight beams, for example, two beams of light will pass right through each other with no scattering, no interaction, no awareness of each other's presence. The field of light, the field of electromagnetism, is not aware of light. Light is not a self-aware field. But in contrast, the unified field or superstring field is a completely self-referral, self-aware field, a completely self-interacting field, as this chart shows, because at that fundamentally unified level of natural law, there's nothing else for the unified field to interact with. The unified field interacts with itself alone. It responds dynamically to its own presence. And on the basis of the self-interaction, systematically leads to the emergence of all the diversity of the universe. <coughs> so we see from this chart that the unified field or superstring field <coughs> is an <coughs> unified field is an infinitely dynamic field 
of self-aware, self-interacting intelligence. <clears throat> and self-aware, dynamic, self-interacting intelligence is consciousness. These are the defining characteristics of consciousness. So we have identified the unified field through the mathematical approach of modern physics with the field of consciousness, a field of universal intelligence, the unity at the basis of all diversity. Having established that the unified field is a field of consciousness, what is the technology to access it and to apply it? That technology utilizes the most sophisticated machinery in the universe, the machinery of the human nervous system, the machinery of consciousness, if you will, that is the human nervous system that has access to the field of consciousness and with proper training can directly experience and explore this unified level of consciousness at the deepest level of mind. <clears throat> this is indeed the basis of the world's traditions of meditation. Properly understood and properly practiced, meditation as understood throughout the ages has been a systematic technology to turn human awareness within, as this chart shows, to experience and explore deeper levels of human awareness, finer levels of thought. And as the human mind experiences deeper levels of human intelligence, these correspond to the experience of deeper levels of intelligence in nature, as this chart shows. This inward exploration of consciousness culminates <coughs> in the direct experience of the deepest level of consciousness the simplest, silent, settled state of human awareness, sometimes called the state of pure consciousness, in which the human mind identifies with the unified field. That is, by turning the attention systematically within, <clears throat> human awareness experiences and explores deeper levels of nature's functioning and directly experiences the unified field at the source of thought the field of unity at the basis of mind and matter. <clears throat> this approach of direct experience of the unified field is both ancient and modern. The Vedic tradition of knowledge from ancient India is the most complete and highly developed tradition of meditation in the world. And yet this ancient approach of gaining knowledge and experience of natural law, the unified field, has also become the focus of intense scientific research over the past 50 years. Maharshi Mahashyogi has revived from the ancient Vedic science of consciousness systematic technologies for experience of the unified field, including the Transcendental Meditation Program and its advanced techniques, including yogic flying. <coughs> These Vedic technologies of consciousness, revived in a systematic and scientific way by Maharshi Mahashyogi, have become the world's most widely practiced, extensively researched, and broadly prescribed by doctors of any program of meditation in the world. Indeed, any program for the promotion of full human potential. These techniques, again, systematically lead the attention within to experience the unified field and it is the experience of the unified field that harnesses and mobilizes the unified field for practical application in the life of the individual and in the life of society. The <clears throat> physical confirmation <clears throat> of the innate capability of the human brain to experience the unified field through these meditation programs is validated in many, many ways. It is validated by the direct experience of literally millions of people throughout the world who've engaged in this practice, who practice Maharshi's Transcendental Meditation regularly, twice a day, and gain experiential confirmation through the direct experience of unity. 
of universal intelligence at the basis of mind and matter. It is confirmed through an abundance of scientific research that shows the completely holistic, life-supporting benefits of this experience of the unified field in all aspects of health and learning and brain development and behavior, applications to the individual and society that have been confirmed by over 600 published scientific studies conducted by 250 independent universities and research institutes in 35 countries throughout the world, making this technology of consciousness the most extensively proven technology for the full development of human potential in the world. All these life-supporting benefits to health, to learning, increased intelligence, creativity, all these wide-ranging, purely positive benefits are a testimony to the unified nature or holistic nature of the unified field and its technologies. <clears throat> also, as this next picture shows, the practice of yogic flying, a very advanced and very powerful technique, a technology of the unified field, revived from the Vedic literature by Maharshi. In this technique, a mere impulse of thought projected from the super unified scale, from the level of pure consciousness, mobilizes the laws of nature in such a way that the body spontaneously lifts up. It rises in the air by a mere impulse of thought, demonstrating that this unified level of human awareness is at the level of the unified field from where all the laws of nature can be easily commanded. This super unified level of natural law is the field of quantum gravity. And only from the field of quantum gravity can the classical laws of gravity be commanded. The fact that the body lifts in the air in apparent violation of the classical laws of Einstein and of Newton shows that the human awareness is capable of functioning at an even more fundamental level of gravity, the level of quantum gravity, which is the level of the unified field. <clears throat> so the phenomenon of yogic flying in the body spontaneously lifting by mere impulse of thought is a direct empirical confirmation, again, of the innate capability of human awareness to function from the level of the unified field. That phenomenon is confirmed mathematically in the following simple equation, Einstein's general relativistic field equations, which show how an impulse at the level of the unified field gives command over gravity, as we saw in the previous demonstration of yogic flying. This simple formula shows how the curvature of space g mu nu on the left, which is the gravitational force that controls the motion of the body t mu nu, or stress energy tensor of the body, in the middle of the equation, how gravity is influenced and in turn the body influenced through the introduction of an impulse at the level of the unified field, shown on the right-hand side of this equation in the term g mu nu, the metric tensor, multiplying lambda, the so-called cosmological constant. This cosmological constant is a manifestation of a level of nature's functioning that is beyond space, beyond time, beyond particle, beyond force, beyond energy, it's a purely unmanifest impulse at the level of the unified field, which is given the name quintessence in the language of modern science, but it shows how an impulse at the level of unity influences the curvature of space-time, g mu nu, and in turn can cause the body to rise in the air. All of this again simply shows, simply demonstrates how human awareness properly trained through these advanced technologies of consciousness derived from the Vedic wisdom can give access and control to this fundamental level of natural law, the unified field at the basis of all the laws of nature governing the universe. Now let us first, before we examine the impact on society, look at the effect of this experience on the individual and in particular on individual brain functioning. <clears throat> this chart shows the effect on the electrical activity of the brain 
of the experience of the unified field within, in this fourth state of human consciousness. Modern physiological science identifies this pure consciousness, this experience of the unified field, to be a fourth major state of human consciousness, meaning distinct from waking, dreaming, or deep sleep. This fourth state of consciousness is, has a completely different subjective structure than waking experience, for example, because waking consciousness is a diversified state of consciousness and is always characterized by the presence of a knower or consciousness, an object of knowledge, whether concrete or subtle, and a process of knowing that connects the knower with the known. That threefold structure is the defining characteristic of waking consciousness that is transcended in this fourth state of consciousness, which is a unified state of consciousness in which the knower, knowing, and known are united in one self-aware structure of consciousness. Consciousness aware of itself. Physiologically, this fourth state of consciousness is distinct from waking, dreaming, or sleeping, characterized by a profound state of rest, much deeper than sleep, a marked reduction in metabolic activity of the body, and a profound state of coherence or alertness in the mind. If we can again see this chart, this chart shows the brain functioning of an individual on the left, shown is a top view of the brain at the top, and a front view of the brain at the bottom. And on the scalp are positioned these small dots, which indicate the locations of electrodes measuring the electrical signals of the brain, the electrical activity of the brain. And connecting these dots, we see in a few places, are bars that indicate that these neighboring points in the brain are communicating. That is, that there is a coherent or correlated functioning, an integrated functioning among neighboring regions of the brain. But not a great deal of such coherence in agitated, normal waking consciousness, in contrast to the charts on the right. On the right-hand side of this chart is shown the very same individual three months later. And this individual in this chart, <clears throat> on the right-hand side, is practicing Maharshi's Transcendental Meditation Program. In this case, we see the same electrodes measuring the electrical activity of the brain. But in this case, there are bars connecting virtually every single electrode, which indicates that the entire brain now is communicating and functioning in a highly correlated, highly integrated way. This chart shows, again, a strong correlation between the left and right hemispheres of the brain, between the frontal and occipital lobes of the brain, and the temporal and parietal lobes of the brain, such that the entire brain functions in concert, in a highly integrated way. This in itself is a scientific breakthrough of the foremost magnitude, because what we have, therefore, in Transcendental Meditation is a very simple universal practice, practice 20 minutes twice a day typically, that develops the integrated functioning of the brain. This integrated functioning is of principal importance, paramount importance, because this coherent brain functioning correlates scientifically with rising IQ, that is, increased intelligence, increased creativity, improved academic performance and learning ability, increased moral reasoning, improved psychological stability, increased emotional maturity, improved alertness and reaction time. Everything good about the brain depends on its orderly functioning. And today, as this chart shows, orderly brain function can be systematically developed now in anyone, any student or any individual of any age just through direct experience of the unified field, which brings integrated or unified functioning of the brain. <clears throat> One very important application of this increasing integrated brain functioning is in education. And then we'll talk about its application in the context of defense. Education today does not develop the integrated functioning of the brain. And that is simply because there's nothing in the educational experience, nothing in the current conventional curriculum 
that engages the total brain. Specific fields of academic study, such as physics and mathematics or literature, the arts, music, these different activities of learning engage small fractions of the brain, slivers of the brain, but none of these conventional learning experiences, disciplines, engage the total brain and do not, therefore, develop the brain holistically. <coughs> The next chart shows what is altogether too often <clears throat> the result of this fragmented educational experience. What we see here are two brains, a normal brain on the left and the brain of a violent student on the right. And these are actually bottom views of the brain looking up, where the front of the brain is shown at the top of the chart. In the violent brain on the right-hand side, we see that the brain appears to be filled with holes. Now, these aren't actual holes in the physical gray matter of the brain, but they are functional holes. That means parts of the brain that are not actively firing, that are not participating actively in our moment-by-moment -moment experience. This very fractured and fragmented physiology of the brain that results from conventional education is not the holistic development of the innate potential of the human brain, which is truly vast in comparison to what education normally delivers. Of greatest concern in this chart, again on the right-hand side, is the apparent clustering of these functional holes in the prefrontal cortex at the front of the brain, shown at the top of this chart. The clustering of these functional holes at the critical prefrontal cortex is of greatest concern because this area of the brain is called the higher brain. It's responsible for all of our higher human functions, for moral reasoning, for judgment, for planning, for the ability to consider the implications of one's actions. In education, we see the prefrontal cortex is not properly developed. It is filled with functional holes. This is in part due to the fragmented nature of conventional education today, but it is also due to stress. Stress in the classroom, stress that pervades our urban environments, stress that pervades so many areas of the world today. Under stress, the prefrontal cortex, also called the CEO of the brain, because the prefrontal cortex sits over the rest of the brain and exerts executive control that organizes and controls the brain, it acts as our rational filter against primitive, impulsive, aggressive, violent behavior. Under stress, this prefrontal cortex shuts down, as it must, in the sense that in a stressful circumstance where you have to respond immediately to a situation of fire, it's not the time to philosophize, it's the time to move. <laughs> but under chronic stress, this prefrontal cortex shuts down chronically and fails to develop normally. Ordinarily, this higher brain develops between adolescence and the age of 25. After the age of 25, no more development of the higher brain is generally considered possible. But this development of the higher brain is what distinguishes adults who have control over their actions from children who don't have control over their action. Violent prisoners and criminals do not have such executive control. They have functional holes in the prefrontal cortex. It's due to a lack of proper development <coughs> of the higher brain. Now, because of stress throughout society and because of inadequate education, much of society fails to properly develop the prefrontal cortex. And to some degree, we are living in an adolescent society. And any examination of tensions and violence and immature behavior, short-sighted behavior throughout the world will confirm that to a degree we are living in an adolescent society. All of this is due to lack of proper brain development. <coughs> With Transcendental Meditation, this technology of direct experience of the unified field, we can promote balanced brain development. Firstly, the deleterious effects of stress are immediately reversed. Because as we saw a moment ago, stress shuts down the higher brain and prevents it from developing properly. Let me show you this chart, very important study, on stress 
and the reduction of stress through Maharshi's Transcendental Meditation, because as we've seen, this is so vitally important for proper brain development. <coughs> this study is important because it is a meta-analysis of 146 previously published studies. It shows that Transcendental Meditation is more than twice as effective as any other approach ever studied by science in reducing the deleterious effects of stress. Other relaxation programs, meditation programs, progressive muscle relaxation, biofeedback, etc. None of these, by the way, are particularly effective at reducing stress, even in comparison to placebo. But in contrast, Transcendental Meditation is profoundly effective at reducing the effects of stress and its negative impact on brain development. One direct consequence of this reduction of stress is shown in the following graph which shows the remarkable benefits to human health as a result of twice daily practice of this technology of the unified field, Maharshi's Transcendental Meditation. This chart is a study on thousands of Blue Cross Blue Shield subscribers and shows marked reduction of disease in every major category of illness, including 87% reduction in heart disease, 93% reduction in diseases of the nervous system, and so forth. Today we can understand how one simple, powerful approach of Transcendental Meditation could have such broad-ranging impact on health. Actually, there are many deep reasons for this, but one reason we already understand, based on what we've discussed so far, and that is that today, according to the U.S. government, most disease, the vast majority, is caused by stress or severely complicated by stress. So eliminating the deleterious effects of stress through the very profound rest gained by Transcendental Meditation will naturally prevent and reverse all these stress-related illnesses. So in the context of what we were saying before, this reduction of stress will cause, allow for the proper development of the brain. But of course, Transcendental Meditation does much more than release stress, but it also directly activates the entire brain, including the prefrontal cortex, and it integrates the prefrontal cortex with the rest of the brain so that the whole brain becomes profoundly integrated in its functioning. And this integrated or unified brain functioning is obviously important for a secure and peaceful world because so much crime, so much terrorism, so much war in the world is caused by this type of stressed, underdeveloped brains. Indeed, even crime in society caused by criminals are actions that are, again, the result of such an underdeveloped and stressed brain. So proper, balanced brain development, which is easily achieved just through this simple approach of this technology of the unified field applied to education is the basis of a productive citizen of a society, a properly developed citizen with the total functioning, proper functioning, balanced functioning of the brain. And a law-abiding citizen, a life-supporting citizen, is clearly the basis of a law-abiding and life-supporting society. So let us consider now the important point of today's talk, which is the application of this technology of the unified field, technology to experience and to apply this most fundamental and powerful level of nature's functioning, the application to society, to national defense, and to invincibility. <clears throat> Fundamentally, the application of this technology of the unified field through the individual nervous systems, individual citizens of society, is by enlivening unity in the collective consciousness of society. This unified brain functioning, this integrated brain functioning, is the basis of an integrated society. This experience of unity at the basis of the mind is the basis of enlivening unity in the collective consciousness of society. And a unified society, an integrated society, is an indomitably strong society. So the application 
of the unified field to society is principally through individual and collective practice of transcendental meditation and advanced techniques which enlivens integrated brain functioning and the integrated functioning of society the coherent unified functioning of society which as we will see renders the society renders the collective consciousness integrated and strong indomitably coherent free from any disruptive or perturbing elements let us begin this discussion with a very very simple description which will allow us I think to intuitively see the direct application to society to defense to invincibility of what we've described so far and then we'll go more deeply into the fundamental principles that support this finding we have seen <clears throat> that individual stress is the cause of so much stress-related disease and so much stress-related behavior stroke hypertension heart disease drug abuse alcohol abuse violent behavior is all the result of stress on the individual brain functioning similarly in society a society composed of such stressful individuals is a stress society and stress-related illnesses and crime violence terrorism even war will be characteristic of such a stressed society. On the other hand, we have seen, according to extensive published medical research, that transcendental meditation, this technology of the unified field, effectively dissolves individual stress, prevents stress-related illness, and prevents stress-induced behavior, promoting life-supporting behavior. We've seen this on the individual level. Similarly, it follows that since individuals are the units of society, that on a collective level, the practice of transcendental meditation, this technology of the unified field, will dissolve collective stress and promote societal behavior in harmony with natural law, a stress-free, problem-free, crime-free, disease-free society. <clears throat> so this is all on the level of common sense. <clears throat> Let's state it another way if we look at this chart. Individual coherent brain functioning, shown here in this meditating brain on the right, is the basis of integrated functioning of society, an integrated coherent society, which is impervious to disruption. But what is surprising, what is novel, and what is extremely fortunate to society and of tremendous value to any military commander, any head of state, any commander-in-chief, is the remarkable power of the collective practice of the technology of the unified field. And that is what we will focus on now for the duration of this time. The power of groups of individuals collectively experiencing, collectively stimulating the field of unity at the basis of the diversity of mind and matter is vastly more powerful than individual meditators practicing this experience individually. When groups of experts in these peace-promoting technologies are gathered together, their influence on society is enormously enhanced. And as we'll see in this chart, this is an inevitable application of a simple universal principle of constructive interference. Let's take the example of loudspeakers. I think this will be instructive. This chart shows three loudspeakers on the left, each loudspeaker producing the same sound. That is, three loudspeakers playing a monural musical signal. These three waves add together to produce a combined wave that is three times as high as an individual wave from a single loudspeaker. But the power or intensity of sound in that in, in that combined wave is not three times but nine times the power of an individual wave because the power of a wave is proportional to the square of the amplitude of the wave. This is a universal principle of constructive interference or coherent superposition of amplitudes that shows that the radiated power of coherent sources grows as the square of the number of radiators. This leads us to expect as experiments have confirmed that when individuals collectively practice transcendental meditation and advanced techniques yogic flying 
collectively stimulate this unified field, this influence, the waves of unity, waves of positivity that are produced, combine coherently. And that constructive interference leads to a radiated influence of positivity and peace that is proportional to the square of the number of individual meditators. The inverse function to the square is the square root. And that explains why it is that only the square root of the population of a society is needed to produce such a coherent, peaceful influence. Indeed, according to empirical research and abundant published scientific studies, only the square root of 1% is empirically required to produce a very powerful, scientifically measurable influence of positivity and coherence to profoundly reduce crime, for example, to reduce terrorism, to prevent war, even stop war in war-torn areas, when only the square root of 1% of the population of a country, for example, practices this technology of the unified field together. <clears throat> for the United States, with a population of 300 million, that means only a little less than 2,000 such trained experts in the technology of the unified field are necessary to produce a very powerful influence of positivity that can neutralize any negativity and prevent crime, prevent war, really rendering the country impervious to any disruption, impervious to any attack, as we will soon see. For a small country like Holland, for example, only 400 such trained experts are enough to really raise that country to a state of invincibility. And before describing that mechanism in detail, in just a moment, let's glance quickly at a few of the hundreds of studies that have been published on the individual and societal benefit of group practice of transcendental meditation and yogic flying, particularly for reducing crime, terrorism, and war, and thereby rendering a country invincible. <clears throat> this national demonstration took project took place in the summer of 1993 in the capital of the United States, Washington, D.C., which is a very high crime city. And here, several thousand meditators gathered from throughout the world to practice their technology of the unified field as a group. And what was studied in the context of this scientific experiment were crime rates, that is, violence in the city of Washington and the reduction of violence through such group practice. This was a highly, uh, carefully controlled study with a 27-member scientific board of authors, scientific authors, including the FBI and the police department in Washington, D.C. That was a collaborator on the study. And before the study took place, I remember the chief of police was somewhat ambivalent about the study, not sure that we really would be able to produce such a demonstrable effect on reduction of crime. And he went on television to say that he would gladly participate in the study and commit the resources of his department, but he had some doubts. He said it would take two feet of snow here in the summertime to reduce violent crime in Washington, D.C. by more than 20 percent. We predicted at least 25. And then when the study took place, as we see again in this chart, when halfway through the two-month period, when we had gathered a couple of thousand of meditators and yogic flyers in Washington, D.C. to practice this program in groups, there was a marked and immediate drop in violent crime by 25% as predicted in advance, and as exactly had been seen in 52 previous published scientific studies. This reduction of violence in the nation's capital was a highly statistically significant result. The likelihood that this drop in crime was simply due to chance is less than one part in 10,000, which makes this an extremely highly statistically significant result. Subsequently, the effect of such group meditation was explored on preventing violence and war. In one war-torn area of the world, in the Middle East, scientists, for the sake of experiment, assembled a group of six, seven, eight hundred meditators right in Jerusalem at the peak of the Lebanon War and predicted in advance that such a group practicing their yogic flying together would markedly reduce the level of war violence 
war deaths, war injuries, and levels of conflict in the Middle East. This is a two-month study in which the number of yogic flyers rises and falls on, uh, falls on any given day according to the numbers who are available to practice their program together on a given day. And that rise and fall in the number of yogic flyers is shown in the dotted line on this chart. In addition to the dotted line is a solid line that shows progress towards peace in the Middle East as measured by reduction of war deaths, war injuries, and so forth. There is an obvious visual correlation or covariation between the number of meditators meditating as a group and progress towards peace in the Middle East. An average 70 to 80 percent reduction in war deaths and war related injuries directly attributable to this coherence creating group. Again, a highly statistically significant effect. When this study <clears throat> was published in the prestigious Yale University Journal of Conflict Resolution, it created a firestorm in the field of criminological and peace-related research. And the editors of the journal, so moved by the potential impact of this experiment, the potential implications of the study for peace in the world and for national security, urged other scientific collaborations to repeat the study and examine the influence of group meditation on the war in the Middle East. So for the next two and a quarter years, <clears throat> seven additional scientific collaborations assembled groups of yogic flyers of different sizes in different vicinities of the Middle Eastern conflict to examine the impact of group meditation on war. In every one of these studies, a highly statistically significant reduction in war, an average 78% reduction in war deaths and war-related injuries, and progress towards peace was indicated. Every one of these studies, again, highly statistically significant, and the combined significance of all of these replications was one part in 10 to the 19th, which means less than one part in 10 million, 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 that this reduction of war and prevention of violence and terrorism was due to chance. No, it could only be due to the group influence, the rising positivity and coherence produced by these coherence creating groups of yogic flyers. This phenomenon was predicted in advance by Maharshi Mahesh Yogi and is known in the literature as the Maharshi effect. Reducing social violence, crime, and war through group practice of yogic flying by accessing and stimulating the field of unity, the unified field within. This Maharshi effect, on the basis of this and much more research, has become the world's most widely studied, intensively scrutinized, and rigorously verified of any phenomenon in the history of the social sciences. <clears throat> Now I'd like to just end with a few principles that shed fundamental light on the mechanics of peace and national invincibility through this group dynamics of consciousness. This group dynamics of consciousness in increasing social invincibility, that means spontaneous prevention of violence and conflict, is really a straightforward application of the Meissner effect. The Meissner effect itself is just a quantum enhancement of the third law of thermodynamics. The Meissner effect shown in this chart <clears throat> is the spontaneous ability of a superconducting magnet, a superconducting metal, to expel any disruptive influence. On the right hand side we see a metal that has been supercooled to within a few de degrees of the absolute zero of temperature. In this ultra-low temperature state, the randomizing influence, thermal influence, is eliminated, and as a result, the atomic constituents of the superconductor are moving in harmony, in a high degree of coherence. This internal coherence renders the superconductor literally invincible, impermeable, and these disruptive external magnetic field lines are expelled and repelled from the interior of the superconductor. In marked contrast, on the left-hand side, we see an ordinary conductor at room temperature where the randomizing thermal effects of temperature have caused a chaotic motion 
with no internal coherence of its atomic substituents. And in this randomized state, this low coherent state, there is no invincibility, and, this, and the conductor is easily penetrated by these external magnetic field lines. All this is simply an illustration of a deep principle of invincibility in nature. The principle of invincibility through indomitable internal coherence. <clears throat> the same principle applies to a nation, or indeed to any system. A nation is a collection of individual subconstituents, individual citizens. When the citizens are functioning coherently together, such a coherent society is impervious to disruption. It can't be perturbed or disturbed by any disturbing influence from within or outside the borders of the country. This chart shows what we could call a national Meissner effect in which a disturbing influence from outside the country, whether cultural disturbance or military attack, is just spontaneously repelled from the boundaries of the country. It's as though an impenetrable shield is constructed around a country when the internal coherence of the country is strong. So this is an inevitable application of a deep scientific principle. If we want to understand it in a very simple way, let me just say that we can understand it this way. When a society, a nation, becomes powerfully coherent within itself, when the enlivenment of the unified field, which is pure unity, pure positivity, is fully lively in the life of the people, that nation radiates an influence of positivity and coherence and strength to its neighbors, and no neighboring country would ever react with negativity against a neighbor that was so powerfully positive, powerfully coherent, such a nourishing influence. <clears throat> that means potential enemies or adversaries in neighboring countries are in effect neutralized by the positivity that is radiating from the country. In other words, it's not necessary for national security to destroy a country or destroy an enemy. But instead, through this technology of the unified field, you can destroy the enmity within a particular adversary, potential adversary. You can destroy the negativity, turning a potential enemy into a friend. And today, the only means of national security, of national invincibility, is to be a nation without enemies. That's because every military strategist will tell you that there's no conventional defense anymore against modern destructive technologies. Weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons, biological weapons, chemical weapons, long-range push-button electronic missile technologies, terrorism. There's no conventional defense against any of these offensive technologies. The only effective defense is to prevent the birth of an enemy. And this can now be easily achieved in a scientific way by targeting and neutralizing the enmity in a potential adversary so that no enemies arise. This is strategic defense. In the past, we would align our soldiers on the borders in the hopes of preventing attack. Today, one can simply lob a bomb over the border and there's no defense against such electronic weaponry. So the whole principle of defense based on offense has never worked really and is completely obsolete today. And everyone knows this. Peace through war is an increasingly suspect road to peace these days. There's absolutely no scientific evidence to, to support the premise that war creates peace. Indeed, right now, the intelligence communities of the United States are deeply divided about this issue. The Bush administration began its war on terror some years ago and started to attack Afghanistan, subsequently Iraq, in the hope of eliminating its enemies. But there's absolutely no evidence today that the number of terrorists have been reduced through such a war on terror. Indeed, it seems as though the number of would-be assailants, the number of terrorists willing to attack the United States has been, if anything, increased. And the United States, like every other nation, remains insecure today. In fact, the world is in an extreme state of vulnerability, 
or even the mightiest nations are cowering over the next inevitable terrorist attack. So what Maharshi has brought to the world here through the revitalization of the technology of the unified field in the world and the intense scientific scrutiny and examination of its deep principles is really a technology of invincibility at a time when the world has become extremely vulnerable. And finally, every military commander is always profoundly pinched at the need to send the youth of the country, the pride of the nation, into the battlefield, into war. <clears throat> if the youth of the country are asked to die for their country, then for whom ultimately is that country for? When the youth and the pride of the nation are sacrificing their lives for the sake of the country. And even those who survive the battlefield are asked to claim the lives of others. It's a terrible historic situation, a kill or be killed technology of defense that has never worked. Now it is possible through this most advanced technology of defense to prevent war on a scientific basis and to safeguard the youth of the country who, if they simply utilize this technology, will never have to face the devastation of war, can literally prevent the very birth of an enemy, and can create a family of nations that are harmonious and peaceful, each invincibly strong within themselves. <clears throat> Let me summarize now with a few practical points of implementation of what is indeed an extremely simple and cost-effective technology to implement. Any military charged with the constitutional responsibility to defend the country can now actually succeed in defending the country simply by creating a prevention wing of the military. <clears throat> a prevention wing of the military is just a coherence creating group of yogic flyers equaling or exceeding the square root of 1% of the population of the country, which even for a large country like the United States is only 2,000 individuals. This is less than 1% of the military personnel, such that 99% of the military can continue to do exactly what they do and receive exactly the same training that they conventionally receive. Only 1% need be trained in these additional technologies for invincibility. And the science and technology of consciousness, the unified field, and that small group, that prevention wing of the military, can produce such indomitable coherence and invincibility, preventing war on a scientific basis, such that none of the other soldiers will ever have to face the devastation of war. So there is no risk involved in the application of this technology because the entire military is there to do what it has been doing. Only a small elite group within the military need be trained in these very simple but powerful technologies which not only produce invincibility for the country but powerfully improve and benefit the life of the soldiers themselves, developing full brain potential, robust health, dynamism, and imperviousness to the stress of the battlefield, and so forth. So that is extremely easy and costs virtually nothing because no expensive equipment or machinery, no advanced uh, technological weaponry or equipment is needed at all. Just the machinery of the human nervous system, which is truly the most sophisticated and refined machinery in the universe, which can be trained and put to this purpose of accessing and harnessing the almost limitless power of the unified field. And the fact that only 2,000 soldiers can achieve national invincibility, whereas previous million soldiers could not, is simply a testimony to the technology of the unified field that operates at a level of nature's functioning millions of times more powerful even than the nuclear level. Secondly, even within the military academies, as part of military training, one can achieve an invincible country because there are enough cadets in training easily to exceed the square root of 1% requirement for the country, so that even as part of their training as military, those trainees are already creating indomitable strength of invincibility for the country. 
That's how easy it is to apply. And indeed, education is a natural place to implement the technology of the unified field because education should be to develop the full brain potential, the total potential of mind, body, and behavior, maximum health, maximum dynamism, maximum success and effectiveness and creativity, all of that is achieved through the introduction of these technologies of consciousness that Maharshi has revived for the world and as a side benefit, the invincibility of the nation is secured. Again, I want to emphasize that just a few percent of the military is needed, so there is no risk to the military, nothing to lose and everything to gain. And by everything to gain, I not only mean national security and invincibility, which is, of course, the foremost goal, but as a side benefit of that, economic boom, improvement of health of the country, improvement of educational standards of the country, everything simultaneously enriched by this holistically life-supporting, life-benefiting technology. For example, when the national mood is bolstered and buoyed by this positivity, this coherence, then the consumer confidence is higher, the inflation is lower, unemployment goes down, investment goes up, the markets boom. And it's easy to show scientifically and has been shown again and again that enormous good fortune economically occurs to any country that implements this technology for invincible defense. So I'll summarize by saying there is nothing to lose and everything to gain by implementing this technology immediately. It is enormously effective and cost effective. The results are immediate and there's no time to be lost. Every nation should desire to become the first invincible country. And now any nation can be, literally, the first invincible country in the world. All that is necessary is to provide the proper training for a group of military personnel, or indeed any group within the country will suffice. And for this, I invite you to contact us at the following web address. The website is www.invincibledefense.org and you can contact me directly at the email address director at invincibledefense.org. Again, director at invincibledefense.org and the International Center for Invincible Defense of the Global Country of World Peace will immediately respond and help to organize the training of a prevention wing of the military, a coherence creating group to bless the country with invincibility. So I advise you to act immediately. There's nothing to lose and everything to gain. Make hay while the sun shines. We don't know how long this offer will be made so freely available. Now, it'd be a great joy at this time to hear from the Prime Minister of the Global Country of World Peace. But before we do, I understand that through the wonders of technology, the founder of this technology of invincible defense, the founder of the Transcendental Meditation Program and its advanced techniques, including yogic flying, the founder of the Global Country of World Peace is connected to us by televideo conferencing. And if that is the case, it would be a great joy of mine and an honor to introduce Maharshi Mahesh Yogi to comment on this offer of invincible defense. His Holiness Maharshi Mahesh Yogi is the world's foremost scientist of consciousness and foremost Vedic scholar who has revived from the ancient Vedic wisdom these powerful technologies of the unified field. In the Vedic science of Maharshi is a complete science of this unified field that has been glimpsed by modern physics, modern physiology, modern mathematics, modern chemistry. Complete knowledge of that fundamental unity is available in the Vedic science of Maharshi, and most important, the proven practical technologies to access, to harness, to apply this most fundamental and powerful level of nature's functioning for the practical benefit of humankind opening the possibility of invincibility to every nation and permanent peace on earth. 